I'm going to speak in Spanish and then and then I will I, I will speak in English. Okay. okay. I hope you understand. Okay. Well, buenos días. Buenos días a todos los compañeros que se están eh, que están eh, participando en esta videoconferencia. Eh, déjenme comentarles que esta videoconferencia se lleva a cabo en el marco de las actividades de la Cátedra Eugenio Méndez Ocurro que instituyó el Instituto Politécnico Nacional para reconocer la obra del ingeniero Méndez de Curro, un ilustre mexicano y un ilustre politécnico. Y entonces, eh, pues el propuesto de la cátedra es organizar actividades académicas de excelencia. Eh, en esta ocasión, contamos con la participación del doctor Alvin Compán. Él es, eh, durante muchos años, él estuvo trabajando en la Universidad de Toledo, en el estado de Ohio, en Estados Unidos. Y, de hecho, en el, bueno, estuvo trabajando en el área de fotovoltaicos y, de hecho, él fue uno de los eh, fundadores de esta empresa que se llama Lucintec, ¿sí? Que tiene un mercado importante en el, la venta de módulos de celdas solares. Y, entonces, eh, la plática del día de hoy va, va a versar sobre su experiencia como gerente general en el mercado de celdas solares de esta empresa. Bueno, welcome, eh, Profesor Compan. I would want to welcome you and to thank for accepting our invitation to, to participate in this event. Your video conference is uh, carrying out within the frame of uh, Eugenio Mendez de Curro Professorship. Eugenio Mendez, engineer, was an uh, distinguished Mexican who made very important contributions to science and technology development in Mexico. For instance, he was the founder of our faculty, the physics and mathematics faculty of the Polytechnic Institute. And we saw, we, he was also the founder of the Center of Research and Advanced Studies of the National Polytechnic Institute, where Jesus Gonzalez worked and other, and other distinguished researchers, Mexican researchers. So we want to thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, we thank you. We are very pleased. It's an honor to have you here. And I'm going to give the word, the word to Gerardo Contreras. He's going to uh, talk about your professional um, uh, research, your professional uh, uh, trajectory. Thank you again and welcome. Welcome to, so that many Mexicans can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank Gerardo. you for the generous introduction, Professor Tofino. Thank you. It. Thank you very much. So okay. first of all, so first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Compam for having accepted to participate in the conferences in honor of Ingeniero Eugenio Mendez Docuro. But first of all, I want to comment some uh, relevant uh, uh, aspects of uh, Professor Compam academic life. Uh, I'm going to speak in, in Spanish uh, for all our uh, Spanish-speaking people. So uh, I hope you, you can understand some of these uh, few comments on your uh, academic life. No problem. I hope to pick up bits and pieces at least. <laughs> yes. El Dr. Compan realizó sus estudios de licenciatura en Calvin College, Michigan. Su maestría y doctorado en la Universidad de Chicago. Realizó estudios postdoctorales en la Universidad de Nueva York, así como en Alemania, como becario von Humboldt. Fue profesor de la Universidad Estatal de Kansas. Eh, es profesor actualmente investigador emérito distinguido del Departamento de Física y Astronomía y del Wright Center para Innovación y Comercialización de Fotovoltaicos de la Universidad de Toledo, en Toledo, Ohio. Desde julio de 2019 es director de tecnología de la compañía Toledo Solar y también fue presidente de la compañía Lucintec. Es presidente de la compañía eh, Lucintec. En 1987, en la Universidad de Toledo, el doctor Compan fundó un grupo de clase mundial enfocado en celdas solares fotovoltaicas de partículas delgadas, de películas delgadas, centrado en semiconductores 2.6. Colaboró con Harold McMaster y otros fundadores de First Solar. 
En aquel tiempo, recuerdo que la compañía era una compañía de Embrión y se llamaba Solar Cell Sync, que después llegó a ser la compañía Fair Solar, en donde muchos de los este, eh, egresados y a los cuales les dirigió su tesis de doctorado, el doctor Compan, fueron a trabajar. Este, de hecho, el edificio de física y astronomía de la Universidad de Toledo lleva el nombre de Harold McMaster, eh, dado que él eh, eh, dio gran parte del dinero para construir los edificios. En 2009, y a través del Plan Incentivo de Retiro Temprano de la Universidad de Toledo, mantuvo un programa activo de investigación basado en becas para postdoctorados, graduados y licenciaturas. Durante su estancia en la Universidad de Toledo, logró apoyos de diferentes instancias gubernamentales, así como investigaciones colaborativas financiadas por compañías sobresalientes del sector de energías renovables. El doctor Compare es muy activo en la difusión científica a través de presentaciones a lo largo de Estados Unidos. El doctor Compan tiene siete patentes en el área de fotovoltaicas de películas delgadas y es autor de más de 240 publicaciones. Ha dirigido 33 tesis de doctorado, maestría y postdoctorado. Personalmente yo tengo una larga amistad con él, pues que nos conocimos en 1982 y no... Pues no tenemos por el momento mucho tiempo para hablar de estas experiencias excelentes que tuvimos y que hemos compartido como amigos y científicos. So personally, I have a deep friendship with him since I met him in Germany in 1982, and I have not enough time to talk about all the excellent experiences that we have shared as friends and as scientists. So, el profesor Compán nos presentará a continuación su conferencia sobre sus experiencias de, como director general de fotovoltaicos en Lucintec. Please, uh, Professor Compán, uh, the microphone is all yours. <laughs> Thanks a, a lot. Thank you, Professor Contreras. Thanks, Gerardo. Appreciate it. It's great to see you again, even if it's only virtually, but it's great to see your, your face and all the rest of my friends. It would be so much better if we could meet in person, but hopefully one of these days we, we'll get back, I'll be able to get back to, to Mexico and, and see all of you again. I've really enjoyed all of our interactions. So um, I, I, I hope I can meet the uh, expectations. I hope you didn't paint too, many, too great an expectation for, for me in, in your introductions, but So um, we have about 30 minutes or a little less than that now, or how should I? Miguel, you're muted. We have, we have, uh, we have 30 minutes. We have plenty of time, don't worry. You, you, you take your time, don't right. worry. Okay, I'll try to move through this. So, um, Um, in the next few minutes, I will give you some of my experiences as a CTO and a CEO and president of a small company in the solar cells market. I want to set the stage. I think I've mentioned some of you know that I took a retirement package from the University of Toledo about 10 years ago and decided that it would be interesting to be involved in, in a company. And at that time, I had the opportunity, a good friend of mine had started a company in the amorphous silicon space. And he, and he thought there was a good match to, to be able to do some work, not only in amorphous silicon, but in cadmium telluride. So we started out with the idea of developing a company that would work with flexible cadmium telluride. And that's how our story begins. So just to kind of give a pictorial overview of what we started out, we formed the company Lucentech and with the original idea that we work with flexible, flexible solar cells, not transparent. The first substrate material that we worked on was polyimage. This is actually on Kapton, a DuPont product, Kapton. 
this is about a five foot long deposition and about one foot wide. We've also then transitioned to use a flexible glass. This has been laminated, but this is on a flexible glass from Corning, a Willow product, which actually works very, very nicely. But um, for a variety of reasons, we felt that the flexible product line was not going to be our best approach to commercialization. So we transitioned to going to a semi-transparent product. And so after a few years, we worked on developing ultra-thin cadmium telluride. And this is a small um, prototype, only three inch by five inch. And this is a typical color of cadmium telluride when you have only about a third of a micron of cadmium telluride. We developed a process to change the colors so that, with the idea that this could be put into windows. Our last uh, work is in, in collaboration with a company called Toledo Solar. And in this case, we're actually taking a standard panel. This is now uh, a two foot by four foot panel. And if you put it in a window and look from the inside, this is the visibility you see from the inside. This is done by a laser ablation process where we're partially removing some of the coating. And this is the same panel, but taken outdoors and looking in reflection. So you still get very nice reflection from the panel. So the idea is that this could be used on buildings. Anyway, I'm going to give a little overview of most of our effort with semi-transparent materials. And again, just to set the timeline here, we formed the company in 2008. I retired later that year from the university. And it started it's, it's with the name of Sunlight 26 Solar because we were starting as a wholly owned subsidiary of Sunlight Corporation. The investors in, in Sunlight put up $400,000 to get us started. So we were called Sunlight 2626 for group two, group six material, cadmium telluride as a limited liability corporation. Sun Ming Deng was the first president of Sunlight 26. He was the president of Sunlight. And I served as a chief technology officer. In 2012, we arranged for a buyout to become independent. So we changed from being Sunlight 26 to change our name to Lucentech with the idea that we're looking at um, Lucid, Lucid with the idea of semi-transparent, Lucid tech. And at that point, the buyout, we had a value of $700,000. This money actually went to the company Sunlight to buy us out. So we did not realize any private investment, but this investment came from two venture capital companies and from the University of Toledo Innovation Enterprises, with each of us, including myself about 25% owner of the company. Two years later in 2014, Sunlight, the parent company, ceased operation. And since we were renting space from Sunlight and Sunlight was going out of business, we had to move. And that's how we ended up in the University of Toledo incubator building, which is where we are now from, since 2014. And last year we started a, a relationship with Toledo Solar, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So our technology I already mentioned, we started out with the idea of doing flexible cadmium telluride on Capton or Upilex or on Willow Glass, but we felt that that was not going to be commercially very successful. So we changed our focus to working on semi-transparent windows using very th thin coatings of cadmium telluride. I mentioned the disruption in 2014 when we had to find, scramble to find a new home. Along the way, we also had a project for a couple of years to develop neutron detectors using cadmium telluride, essentially a modified solar cell to uh, develop neutron detectors using a layer of lithium that would be the sensitizing agent. And that, that has been relatively successful with lithium innovations, although we still have yet to find a major corporate partner. 
So one of the backgrounds to all of this development is that the price of solar cells or solar modules has been coming down. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this learning curve or experience curve. Whereas in 1974 or 1976, it cost $100 per peak watt to buy a solar cell. But this has been coming down on a log log scale, coming down so that today you can buy solar modules for what turns out to be about 0.2 cents, 0.2 dollars, 20 cents, 20 cents per watt. When we formed our company, Lucentech or, or Sunlight 26, we were right here. This is, this is of course plotted as a function of cumulative module production. But 2008 is right about here, when the price of modules was three dollars per watt, and the price was artificially high here because of the shortage of polycrystalline silicon. Most of the solar modules are made with silicon wafers. Poly, there was a shortage of polycrystalline silicon, so the price for modules was artificially high, but it's rapidly decreased. And this has caused a tremendous amount of pain and has led to the bankruptcy of many photovoltaics companies. Fortunately, we have, we've avoided bankruptcy, but we have yet to become very successful in terms of manufacturing. But in any case, part, this is part of the explanation for changing our focus from flexible modules to finding a new application for solar modules. So I thought what I would do is give a little bit of a presentation. This would be a typical presentation to potential investors. So this is what I would call, these are a few slides anyway, from the investment pitch that I have given to a number of different organizations and potential investors that range from people from the automotive industry to the buildings industry and, and venture capitalists. So by the way, if anybody wants to ask a question, you feel free to do it. So the investment pitch starts with a little introduction about what is unique about Lucentech. So we would, I'm not going to cover all of these points, but we're basing the technology on cadmium telluride, which has advantages that were proven by First Solar. First Solar started their module manufacturing in 2003. And so they, by 2008, they were already very successful as, a, as the first thin film company to become very successful. So we're trying to leverage off the success of First Solar. First Solar uses a cadmium telluride layer that's about three microns thick, and we're using a layer that's about 0.2 microns thick. We, we point out to the invest, potential investors that we feel the best values are in building integrated PV and in automotive integrated PV. But in spite of selecting a pretty um, definite market application, there's still tremendous uh, opportunity. So if you look at the BIPV window market, that BIPV market can address much of what is often known as the solar control market. And it's roughly, in the, it's roughly about $4 billion per year, which is a part of the larger flat glass market. In the automotive sector, Similarly, if you look at sunroofs, if you say every, every automobile that has a sunroof could very well be a photovoltaic sunroof, again, the potential market is about $4 billion a year. So this is the point of trying to get investors interested. I think I will move on past some of the other highlights of cadmium telluride, electrical performance, the appearance, durability, and cost. Cost-wise, we feel that we can do an added coating, the, co the additional cost of adding the photovoltaic coating would be about 50 cents per watt or about $50 per square, meet, per square meter. So we're looking at markets 
where already you have established you're using glass in either automobiles or, or buildings. And of course, the investor is going to want to know what are the other technologies out there. So we prepared a table like this to address silicon wafers, in film silicon or amorphous silicon, SIGs, dye sensitized solar cells, polymer or organic solar cells. And of course, our point is that cadmium telluride is the best opportunity. So specifically, what are we looking at? What is our value proposition from potential investor? So for building integrated, we say, okay, there are these apartment buildings or high rise office towers that need air conditioning, that need power. They, they require a lot of power. And so there's a lot of glass area and a fair, favorite building construction method is a glass curtain wall. So you have almost wall to wall glass. So that if you, if you can design a coating that goes on that glass, you have a tremendous surface area for um, generating electricity that is also needed inside the building. If you consider putting solar coating on all of the glass, you want to think about what are the what is the productivity, what is the potential power output. If you have a solar panels either ground mounted or on rooftop mounted horizontally, so this is in New York City or could be Toledo, Ohio. If you have horizontal panels as you move from January through December, the production gets much higher in the summertime and falls off in the winter time. But if you have panels that are oriented on the south facing window, you get lots of power. Uh, sorry, this is, yeah, this is for a south facing window. You get good power in the, in the winter time, not as good in the summertime when the sun is high in the sky. And, and if you have windows on the east and west facing um, windows, you, you level out some of this energy generation. Even on the north side, you get a variety, you get a fair amount of power generated, either from indirect sunlight scattered from the clouds in the atmosphere in the sky, or also because the sun rises in the summertime, the sun rises far to the north and sets far to the north. So if you, if you put photovoltaics on all of the windows, this is your production. It's relatively flat over a year. So that's one of the arguments for convincing builders to install photovoltaics. And so in New York City, with their electricity at 20 cents per kilowatt hour, I think it's in the last few years, it's gotten even higher. You could envision for a coating cost of $50 per square meter, you could see a 3.8 year payback in the energy production from the solar modules on the, on the high rise buildings. For automotive integrated, you similarly have issues. Um, if your car is sitting in the hot sun, in 10 minutes, the temperature can rise by 20 degrees. And this is Fahrenheit, actually, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And many cars have sunroofs, and here this is from a Prius. This is the back sunroof on a Prius V, which has got opaque solar cells, silicon solar cells, but it's covered by the headliner on the inside, so you don't see it. There's actually a real see-through um, sunroof on the front over the driver's and passenger's head, but in the back, this is covered by fa fabric on the inside of the car. So the idea is, can you put solar modules on the sunroof like that, and can you talk about the energy payback? And in that case, you can use, well, this is parked in the sun, you can generate enough electricity to run a circulating fan to circulate air through the, the car and keep the interior cooler so that when you start out, you don't have to run the air conditioner at full blast for the first 10 miles or so. When you do that, you get an improved efficiency. So we calculated using some data from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, 
we calculated that you could get a, a two-year payback time if your if your photovoltaic sunroof was sold for two hundred fifty dollars retail. So this is the value proposition. If you go to larger roofs, panoramic sunroofs, you can improve the power output, and you can start talking about generating power that can help to recharge a battery so that you can you can also get you can get a range extension of four to five kilometers range extension if this is typical sunroof a panoramic sunroof that's parked in the sun charge charging a battery during the, the time when you're at work for example or, or at home so these are the typical value propositions that we try to introduce one more is a, a bus of course this provides lots of surface area. You could imagine the semi-transparent photovoltaic modules on the windows, and you could cover non-transparent non on, the, on the surface. And more and more buses are going electric. And we figured that, again, taking the atmospheric conditions, the solar uh, insulation conditions of New York City, that you could generate a total of 6,000 kilowatt hours per year and you could, in, you could get a range, you could get an extension of your range just based on solar power of 4,700 kilometers for this electric truck using typical numbers that come from, this is a Chinese bus, this is one that's in Canada. So you can look at the, the efficiency of these buses. So there's some good payoffs that will go a long way toward improving the um, environmental benefits. I've already talked about technology some, but our, the next point would be with a potential venture capital investor is to, to highlight the technology. So the semi-transparent coatings, only a, a, about a third of a micron of material. You can adjust the, the colors. This color is actually adjusted by the interlayer, these are laminated pieces of glass with an interlayer in between with uh, a color control in, in the inside. Th this is the, um, what we call the four target cube system, which uh, we can do sputtering. We have a sputter gun in each one of the side walls of the chamber, and we can do a full um, up to nine, uh, six inch, six inch by nine inch sizes, mounted on an interior drum, or if we're using Kapton, we can wrap the drum and get a total of five feet. So this is our prototyping system. We have some larger systems that can do two foot by four foot panels that are still in a development stage, but we're we're waiting additional investment for that. The largest that we've done using willow glass is a 260 by 260 millimeter piece of glass. This has been laminated now. You can see the tabs here for the power production. And we think this is actually quite attractive. This is non-transparent and uh, relates back to our original, original plan to um, go with flexible photovoltaics. Potential investors want to know about your technology and, and how you've protected your technology. So then we have a slide here that talks about some of our patent, the patent portfolio. So we licensed uh, eight different patents from the University of Toledo that were developed when I was a faculty member there, and then several patents that were developed by our company related to the transparent cadmium telluride. So this, this is our protection for intellectual property. And just a little bit about how we, how we have maintained our, our, our company over the years. We started out, as I mentioned, with an initial um, investment of 400,000 from investors that were invested in sunlight. We, in 2008 already, we have obtained 
very a sizable grant from the state of Ohio, which is was used to do a lot of the development work with the flexible photovoltaics. And then we had subsequent grants, both from the state of Ohio and from the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, to work on semi-transparent photovoltaics. So we've been very, very lucky to, to be successful with proposals with over $3 million of funding from federal and state sources to help develop the flexible and the semi-transparent technology. For private investment, there was the initial 400,000. There was the $700,000 buyout that made us independent from sunlight. And then additional investment from a venture capital fund, Emerald, 550,000. Some additional private investment from individuals for about 1.5 million. So this is what has allowed us to develop these kinds of products. I, I have to admit that we haven't found the, just the right match with a, either a partner to do a, ven, uh, to, to do a joint venture or with an uh, additional investment to be able to go into semi-transparent or flexible products. But our most uh, encouraging opportunity right now is the relationship that we formed with a company called Toledo Solar. And I mentioned to you before that this is another approach to semi-transparency. And the advantage here, I'll say just a couple of words about the advantages there. So in this case, we're trying to leverage an existing module manufacturing line. This company, Toledo Solar Group of Investors, that bought the assets of a former company called Willard and Kelsey. They were a group um, of people that started a company very similar to First Solar, but they, their technology used, instead of translating the glass horizontally, through, with horizontal carriers, they, they're using a pair of tongs to grab the, the glass and transport the glass vertically through the coating system. So that provides several advantages. But they were in business and, and marketing product for about four years, but went out of business in, 20, in 2012. Again, for some of the same reasons that other companies have, that the price of the modules have come down so drastically. But, but the, the new group of investors have restarted the plant and they're focusing on a particular application. They're focusing on building, building applied and building integrated. So these modules, uh, for the most part from their production, are going on rooftops, residential rooftops. This is, an, this is a market that First Solar has stayed away from putting solar modules on rooftops. And Toledo Solar now believes that they are well positioned to address the rooftop market and we are helping them make an additional to, to develop an additional product line that can allow them to address windows particularly for buildings but um, also probably for for cars and also for facades so often high-rise buildings will have opaque facade material with some windows and the modules can be left opaque and used for the facades on, on buildings. And then we can use a laser to uh, ablate lines to make transparent, transparent windows. And these windows can be um, selected transparency. So we can range from 5% transmission to 50% transmission if we want. And we have to do it in such a way that we can retain the electrical functionality, but that, that looks like it's working very well. So I have one slide, this is the end of my presentation, but I have one slide additional that I just wanted to say a few words about. We're, we're also, one of the most recent work that we had done at Lucentech 
was to use yet another um, substrate material, or actually superstrate material. We're using yttria stabilized zirconia. And this is a product that was made by a small company in Buffalo. It's actually licensed with a license from Corning. This 3YSZ can be laid out in sheets that are very thin. So this uses a 20 micron thick, 20 micron thick zirconia. This has now been coated with um, solar cell material. And we've made many modules on them. So this is about a three inch by five inch piece, which is laser scribed for monolithic integration. And we explored opportunities here with um, unattended air vehicles or drones. So this is from a drone manufacturer in, in Ohio, Tice Corporation. This is um, a, um, about a two meter wingspan here with lots of surface area that we can put the solar modules on. So we can put these mini modules, we can populate a skin of mini modules on this drone. And, and that will generate uh, up to about 100 watts of power when the sun is out. Which easily provides enough power for cruising. So this, has, this is a particular vertical takeoff and landing um, device. So you can see the vertical axis propellers here for takeoff and then horizontal axis propellers front and back for cruising. During cruising, it requires only about 40 to 50 watts of power. So the solar power can easily provide enough power to maintain this aloft until the sun goes down, of course. But this could be very useful for crop surveillance and and other kinds of typical activities for drones. So that was, that's our, our last, um, our most recent product. So that's the end of my slide presentation. I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Okay, thanks a lot, Al. So the, the conference is open for uh, uh, questions, commentar, and doubts, please. Anybody? Well, I have a couple of questions if you allow me to. Yes, please go ahead, uh, Jesus. Uh, uh, very, very nice talk. You know, uh, uh, this is something that we need very much here in Mexico. I mean, we need a uh, very uh, important, uh, prominent scientists to, to look into the opportunities that the market offers, you know, once you have the knowledge, I mean, the money, or, or in, other words, in other words, once you have a competitive uh, project, I mean, the money is going to come, you know, I can see that you have uh, reached uh, almost $10 million, which is a lot of money already. But what, so it, for us, I think uh, that it is very, very, very interesting example, your example. Now going to the presentation, uh, I just wondering for losing tech, what is the 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 the, the ultimate ultimate goal? I mean, the, the, the business model. Are you going to the mass production or panels, produce them and sell them, or are you looking into uh, licensed technologies? And, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So um, we, after seeing some of the problems that a variety of companies have had going, moving into production, we decided that our best opportunity was either to form a joint venture with a, a, a larger company that could, could do the production or to, um, or to license the technology. Okay. Um, because, so originally for the flexible, our plan was to, to develop a roll-to-roll -roll process and that's why we were affiliated with Sunlight. And Sunlight was doing roll-to-roll -roll using stainless steel sheets. We were planning to do roll-to-roll -roll using Captain. But they went out of business before we had a chance to actually move in that direction. Okay, uh, another question is, uh, uh, have you had any barriers to market due to the fact that cadmium is a poison 
element. I mean, is there any, I know there is, it's a very, very, very thin film. So the amount of cadmium there is really small, but you know, you know there is always an issue with cadmium. This is, yeah, this is an issue that we, that we try to address early on in our discussions. And uh, of course, it is, it is a toxic element and, and, but cadmium telluride, the, um, the material, the uh, binary material is much less toxic than elemental cadmium, but you have to be aware of that. But, and, and, and that's partly an issue also if you go to other encapsulation schemes. So if you, if you put your coatings on glass and you add another piece of glass to the back side of it, then you have the, the cadmium well encapsulated. And in fact, the fire tests that have been made with, um, at national laboratories have determined that if you have a house fire, typically you, you'll melt the glass and you basically do an encapsula a glass encapsulation similar to what you often use for radioactive materials encapsulation. But the toxicity, the toxicity issue has decreased recently, I think, with, with the growing use of cadmium telluride cells from first solar. So they have an, an exemption from European standards for use for power generating applications. But, it, but, it's a, but it's always there and we have to be careful to address it carefully, okay. including recycling modules. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, excuse me, yes, Al? Giovanni, Giovanni, Giovanni wants to make a question. Yes. Go ahead, please, Giovanni. Uh, Giovanni. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Dr. Copan, for the talk. Uh, I want to ask which is the lifetime of the solar panel and when this lifetime ends, which, what do we do with the solar panels? They are recyclable or they have to be disposed in a certain manner to stop them? Bueno, well, it's the, the toxicity of cadmium don't get a, in a trash. Mm. Mm. Yes, very good. Yes, that's a very good question. Yes, so um, the companies, the companies need to arrange for re recycling. So first of all, the life we do, uh, or we collaborate with people that can do reliability testing and with the company Toledo Solar that we're working with these days, we have environmental test chambers to do accelerated life testing, to do heat soaking, high humidity, 85, 85, 85 relative, 85 percent relative humidity, 85 percent, 85 degrees Celsius, and do accelerated life testing. Try to demonstrate that there will be a, life, a projected lifetime of at least 25 years. I think First Solar is now uh, offering a 30 year warranty. So we try to leverage off, Lucentech anyway has tried to leverage off some of the work that's been done with other people in the cadmium telluride community. So that life is very long. It's, it's remarkably long for a commercial product that has to be out in the sun, undergo, undergo uh, freezing and thawing cycles and lots of UV exposure. But in the end, you need to be able to recycle. So there, there are now some organizations that are taking charge of some of the recycling effort. But in general, Toledo Solar and First Solar are pre-funding the recovery of either broken or, mod or modules or, or modules that are taken out of service at the end of life. And the companies like um, 5N Plus that supplies cadmium telluride, they will accept recycled cadmium telluride and turn it back into production. Um, Thank thanks. you for that question. Okay, thanks, uh, Giovanni. Uh, thanks, Giovanni. Is there uh, any... 
Yes. Rogelio Mendoza. Uh, he wants to... Okay, Rogelio, go ahead. Rogelio. Hello, hello. Good morning, every, everybody. Uh, dear Dr. Alcompan, it's a pleasure to see you. Um, the question is, is the next, uh, what future do you see for the de development of CDT solar cell with polymer or organic polymer? Uh, your microphone. Doctor, el microphone. Is inactive, microphone. Your microphone. Al microphone. Microphone. Please no activate lo, your microphone, Al. No lo controlas tú, este Miguel. Ya, ya. Ya, ya. Thanks, Rogelio. Um, for, uh, are you asking about um, uh, the, the, the super straight material that the cadmium telluride is coated on? Or are you asking about the tandem devices that between cadmium telluride and organic materials? Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't looked into that very carefully, but there's um, a variety of possibilities. Perovskites, I know there's effort going on to, to work on tandems between cadmium telluride and perovskite materials that would have a, lo a lower band gap. So organic materials with a higher band gap than cadmium telluride would, would be an interesting opportunity. And, and, and perovskites and others with infrared band gaps would, would be another opportunity. I think in general, tandem devices or bifacial devices are a good direction to go to push the efficiency. Hola, Fernando. No. Yeah, it's, it's, give me. Uh, uh. Okay, go ahead, uh, Al. He has all thank you, uh, thank you, Doctor Al. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other question from the audience? Uh, well, I want to make a, I want to make a general comment. Well, uh, Al, it was a very very nice uh, conference. It was a very nice presentation. For me, uh, the success of uh, Lucent Tech is because of innovation. This shows, this, this, this company shows how innovation can lead to, to a successful, to, to make a successful company. Because we, you're, you're still working on cadmium telluride solar cells. I remember that uh, more than 20 years ago, but in the 90s, the search was made uh, very, very extensive on cad telluride cells. And that uh, made the, well, but by that by that time, at the in the in the nineties, the highest efficiency was sixteen percent, and it took uh, more than ten years, maybe, to increase uh, this uh, efficiency to above twenty percent by twenty one, twenty two now. But uh, but you know, um, companies that uh, uh, make a bet on. Uh, selling solar panels for electric, ele, uh, energy, electric energy production have not had uh, success because as you, as you showed in your curve, because of the cost of solar panels w went down, the cost of, uh, of uh, um, kilowatt peak per dollar, it went down. But, uh, but instead of working on that side, you have developed other applications. It is important to have a chief technology officer with a very special talent like yours to make these developments that you have showed to us. So I guess it is a very good example of a company that have, has had a very nice success because of innovation working. And you still, you still continue. Joe's all the work has, has been done on cat telluride cells. So it's a, for me, it's very, it's been a very nice presentation. Thank you very much. And as Jesus Gonzalez said, 
Miguel, 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 thank you. Yes. Miguel, thank you so much for those kind words. You've expressed much better than I could express exactly the point of view that we've taken. We have to be nimble and innovative and continue to innovate and always yes. look for opportunities for new applications. The opportunities yes. are there and the, uh, and, and the payoffs are potentially very large. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. No, thanks to you. Thanks to you for this talk. It, it was for me. It was very, very nice talk. And as Jesus said, we need this kind of people in Mexico. Thank you very much, Al. That's all. I, I just want to make some uh, questions. Uh, the the lithium that uh, is put on the cadmium telluride is a radioactive lithium, or is lithium just only as, a, as an element, as an stable element? Lithium is a stable element, but but it is <clears throat> it is isotopically enriched. So oh, okay. our company, our, our collaborating company, Lithium Innovations, <clears throat> obtained lithium from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So it's enriched uh, lithium six. Uh -huh. Lithium six has a very large capture cross section or okay. reaction cross section for with with thermal neutrons and so this is the activation so we make it by sandwiching it's like if this if this is a can you see me now if yes you, if this is a, a very thin layer of lithium we, we roll out the lithium to about 100 microns and put a the back side of a solar cell on one side the back side of a solar cell on the other side so we, it's a back-to-back so yes. the, okay. when, yes. when the neutron interacts with lithium-6, it generates an alpha particle and a triton. And those charged particles come in through the back door yes. of a cadmium telluride solar cell. I think you've done, you've done work along yes, lines, right? Yes, lithium acts as a converter right. from, uh, from neutron to, yes, okay, okay. Yes. And uh, just be, because we found that, that uh, just only using a cat telluride, although we, we, we have a low uh, gamma rate uh, level, uh, the, the, the converter that we use were uh, this, uh, the usual uh, carbon uh, boride or the, the wax in order to make some uh, conversion from a neutron to alpha particles. Uh -huh. But it uh, works pretty well, okay, with lithium. Okay, but this is rich <laughs> and, uh, and a nice a nice yes. uh, and, and the other question: sunlight moves to China. Do those sunlight is now working in, in China? Sunlight, again, partly because of the cost issues. Sunlight before they went out of business here in Toledo, they had developed a manufacturing subsidiary uh -huh. in, in in China with the idea that they could do the roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing of sheets of amorphous silicon, but then when it's cut up into smaller cells and made into modules, that's a very labor-intensive process. So uh, they have they set up a, a subsidiary in China to do the back-end manufacturing, but that's also gone out of business now because there's no front-end solar module manufacturing. The problem with amorphous silicon, as most of you probably know, is that amorphous silicon is limited in efficiency. So it's very difficult to get much over 10% efficiency. So the top end isn't up at 20 or 22% like cadmium telluride or crystalline silicon, but it's much more limited. So there's not much activity going on in amorphous silicon anymore. And also, the Sunlight China, Sunlight Quinchan is no longer in business. In business. Ah, okay, okay. Just just a comment. Uh, we are very concerned on cadmium telluride and cadmium sulfide and all, all these uh, uh, binary compounds. But also we have to recognize that, for example, in the sample uh, salt, common salt is sodium chloride. Yes. And sodium chloride, especially chlor. Now, in these days, due to this uh, pandemia, yes, 
many people is uh, uh, claiming that uh, uh, oxide chloride uh, ox oxide chlorine chlorine oxide uh, a gas is useful to to get rid of the COVID-19 <laughs> <laughs> and that's very toxic <laughs> but incredible many people is using the, the chlorine dioxide <laughs> anyhow yeah, it comes it come back it comes back to presidents leading yeah. people to <laughs> threat, <huh? laughs> okay well it's well. a lot okay uh, Miguel go ahead well Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Al, for this yeah. interesting. Uh, I, I want to, I want to show your recognition, and to read it for you. Uh, I'm going to share it. the National Polytechnic Institute through the Physics and Mathematics High Studies School wants to deliver this uh, recognition to Dr. Alvin D. Compan for the presentation of this Baidia conference experience as a CEO, Chief Executive Officer in the solar cells market. Probably the title should be Chief Technology Officer. <laughs> that was your main job. As part of the uh, Eugenio Mendez de Curro 2020 Professorship, Mexico City, July 29th, uh, 2020, the technic to the service of the fatherland, I'm saying it as director of the Physics and Mathematics High Studies School. Thank you very much, Al. It was a very, very nice uh, talk, very interesting. I guess uh, I hope this uh, we, we we have to we have to share this this nice experience of yours as a very inno uh, innovative uh, people. Thank that you so was, much for thank you so much for sharing. I mean, I'm okay. indebted to you. It's been very enjoyable thank you. and deeply honored. Thank yes, you. So thank much. you. Thank you for accepting. And well, I'm going to speak now in Spanish. Uh, invitamos a todos a la siguiente videoconferencia este, este viernes 31 de julio a las 10 de la mañana. El doctor Guillermo Santana es la siguiente videoconferencia dentro de la cátedra de Méndez de Curro. Y quienes tengan interés en, de los asistentes en una constancia, por favor, eh, a través del chat, eh, denos sus datos y con mucho gusto. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thanks to many of our friends, Jesus Gonzalez, Rogelio, Thank Patricia. All. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank nice Stay to out. see you again. Hope to see bye. you soon now in Mexico. <laughs> bye. 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 Nice bye. You. Thank you. Ha bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>